Tech Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. It's great to be here, particularly uh, because I do love celebrating entrepreneurship. One of the things I do on the side now is chair this organization called Startup America Partnership, which really is about celebrating and trying to accelerate entrepreneurship through the whole nation and really try to lift up the, the second and third tier regions and build up their entrepreneurial ecosystems. Everybody, of course, knows what's going on in Silicon Valley, and there's a lot of companies there and a lot of venture capital there, and it's a terrific, well-developed entrepreneurial ecosystem. The opportunity, I think, for our nation over the next you know, 10 years is to lift up the second tier uh, and even the third tier into the second tier, uh, and that will result in a, in a proliferation of a lot of innovative companies that will create lots of jobs and drive our economy and ensure our national competitiveness. So that's something I'm really quite passionate about. And needless to say, I'm particularly passionate about doing that in this D.C. region. When I first moved here in 1983, 28 years ago, uh, it was not even the tenth tier in terms of entrepreneurial ecosystems. It was nowhere on the map. It was a, it was a town, do not surprisingly, dominated by the, the government, so almost everybody in the Washington, D.C. area was focused on the government, government contractors or law, law firms or, or lobbyists or what have you. It was really a, a infrastructure to support the, the, the federal government being, being based here. Uh, there really wasn't much uh, in the way of an entrepreneurial uh, community, just a few little smidgens around the, the edges. So I moved here in 1983 to uh, join a little company that uh, was trying to do what was essentially an early interactive uh, service. Unfortunately, it failed, which was my, my first lesson around perseverance. Even Sometimes these things take a little while. Uh, but thankfully, I and two other co-founders, uh, Jim Kimsey and Mark Serif, ended up uh, two years later in 1985 starting uh, what became uh, AOL, not too far from here in the Tyson's Corner area. But when we got started, our venture capital came from uh, New York and Chicago and California and Canada. Our principal legal advice came from, from Boston. Uh, the, the infrastructure to b develop companies in this region just didn't yet, uh, yet exist. And the market that we were uh, pursuing, obviously the internet, really didn't exist either. Only about 3% of, of people were online at the time in this country, and it was less than other parts around the world. So it really was a belief that there was a big idea around the internet and making it part of everyday life, and also a sense that over time, the Washington, D.C. region could develop as a, as, a, as a great entrepreneurial ecosystem. So needless to say, the fact that it has developed so nicely in the last uh, 25 plus years, uh, and there's such a, a great energy, including events like uh, this, is, is, is great to see. And I really do believe this is one of the regions that has an opportunity to really make a move into the top tier. Right now, it's a, the, the National Venture Capital Association, kind of which ranks the cities based on how much venture capital uh, is deployed in different regions, ranks the D.C. region broadly, Virginia, Maryland, D.C., as eighth in the nation, uh, which is, as I said, you know, quite a bit of a jump from where it was you know, even 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago. Uh, but there is an opportunity to continue to develop it, and events like this really help, help do that. I thought I'd touch on a couple other things, and then really want to leave a lot of time for, uh, uh, for your questions. When we got started with AOL, as I said, 1985, and, and it was still a, you know kind of early days, uh, it really was driven by an idea, an idea that someday, somehow, some way, everybody would get connected. And of course, now that seems obvious. Uh, in the mid-80s, it was not at all obvious. A lot of people had tried this, this you know, Knight Ritter and AT&T, a lot of very significant companies had tried to create interactive services for consumers, but it just didn't stick. People weren't embracing it. And most people looked at that and concluded that consumers don't want interactivity, that, that there's something in, you know, inherent about the, what was going on here that really made, it just wasn't that appealing. People just weren't, the dogs weren't eating the dog food kind of uh, dynamic. In fact, as we all know now, it just wasn't quite ready for prime time. It was still too expensive, it was still too hard to use, most people didn't have PCs, the people who did have PCs, most didn't have modems. You remember back then, you actually had to go to the peripheral section of the computer store to get a modem because people thought communications, interactivity was a peripheral part of the computing experience. Now, of course, it's the, the central part of the experience. There was just a lot of things that were, were bottlenecks, and it really took a decade before 
we really broke through and, and other companies uh, broke through as well. So this point about perseverance, I think, was really critical. Most of the, the big ideas take a decade or more to, to really hit their stride. The, there's occasionally overnight successes, uh, but they're pretty rare. So if you really have to believe in, in your idea and have a team of people that believe in the idea, you know, passion about that idea and perseverance, what I call the three Ps, people, passion, and perseverance. That's particularly true if you're trying to pursue a big idea that could change the world. There's a lot of companies that have little ideas around particular products, and they might build them up and sell them off to somebody, and, and that's okay. It's more of a built-to-flip model. But if you really have a built-to-last, change-the-world model, it's typically going to take a, a decade or more. So you really have to be recognized it is a, a marathon, not a sprint, and organize yourself and your team and your mindset ar around that. And it's, it's less common, but I think it's really important. And I'm particularly supportive of the companies that are in that built to last change the world model, because I know it is harder, but when they break through, if they break through, obviously not all do, uh, it has a much more significant impact in terms of what can happen in society, and it's much better return in terms of investment. It's just much more satisfying in terms of spending your time on something you know, that's a, that's a big idea that can change the world as opposed to something that's more incremental and, and, uh, and tactical. And so that's one general dynamic to, I think, be focused on and try to understand what really are your motivations. Are you focused on something just because you see a, a little niche thing you want to grab, or is there some, some bigger idea uh, you want to pursue? Because that will drive a lot of the thinking in terms of how you uh, approach things. My own experience, obviously, with, with AOL was a pretty much a 20-year journey. The first 10 years was really about building and pioneering. The second 10 years was when it really kind of hit its stride and became much more of a, a mainstream phenomenon. And I, and I like both phases, but I actually particularly like that early stage pioneering phase. That even though it was hard, even though it was challenging, even though it was frustrating, we went through at least three or four rounds of layoffs where we thought something was taken off and it turned out it was, you know, wasn't quite ready. And so there was a lot of, you know, a lot of folks, including family members and friends, would say, Steve, I mean, like, give it up. You know, just, this doesn't seem to be working. You should, you should go do something else. But thankfully, we had a team that really was, was uh, you know, passionate about that idea and finally was able to, uh, you know, to break through. And then the last seven or eight years, I've focused uh, through a, a firm not too far from here called Revolution on backing and mentoring uh, entrepreneurial companies. Instead of doing it myself as the entrepreneur kind of operator, doing it more as a, on the on the sidelines, but being pretty active in trying to help uh, build the companies. And that's been very satisfying. Companies like Living Social, that's uh, just a few blocks from here. I think Aaron is speaking uh, later today as a, an example of that, or Zipcar, a company that uh, uh, just went public you know, a month or two ago. These are, these are great companies that have the potential to have a significant impact. And Zipcar is actually another example of this sort of takes a while. The, the company was started a decade ago. We got involved uh, about five years ago. Uh, and it, it's really a decade in the making overnight success. And this is common with these businesses that just have there's some challenge around you know, building them up. So let me f finish on a little bit on why entrepreneurship in America is so important and why things like the Startup America Partnership are so important. Uh, everybody knows the economy is, is sluggish. Uh, I think everybody recognizes that the uh, level of unemployment right now, about 9 percent, is, is uh, problematic and, and not really sustainable in, in a healthy kind of way. Uh, and the question, what do you do about it? And it's getting more attention in the halls of Congress, the White House, other places, which is great. There's much more of a focus now on the economy and jobs than there was, say, a year or two ago. And when you really look at it, and you kind of peel back the onion and look at the data, the secret sauce that drives the economy, and actually is the secret sauce that's driven America for the past you know, 200 plus years, is entrepreneurship. This country was built by entrepreneurs, the cities were built by entrepreneurs who really had great ideas about new industries, and those new industries, whether it be automobiles in Detroit or what have you, really help create whole cities and whole regions. So that's really the story of America, is the story of entrepreneurship. And even more recently, if you look at the data, and there's a foundation called the Kauffman Foundation that really focuses on tr entrepreneurship and does a lot of research, all, all of the net jobs created in the last 30 years were created by young, high-growth companies. 40 million jobs. So if, you, if you're trying to drive the economy and you're trying to create jobs, You've got to go all in on entrepreneurship. And so figuring out ways to set the policy in Washington to make it friendly 
to entrepreneurs, make it easier to get started, make it easier to get access to capital, make it easier to get you know intellectual property you know, protection if that's uh, important, make it easier to export your uh, your products, make it easier to access mentoring so you get you know, organizations like this, so you get help as you're trying to build your companies. Anything you can do to reduce barriers and unlock uh, potential and upside has a potential dramatic effect on the economy and, and, and job creation. So that's what the Startup America partnership is really about, trying to mobilize that. It just got started a few months ago, so it in and itself is a startup. Uh, but I think we've got some, some, some good momentum and, and you know, a lot of companies are, are joining to try to provide resources to early uh, stage entrepreneurs and also the, in the startup phase and also these companies in what we call the speed up phase. Uh, and we're also getting uh, regional ecosystems developed. We launched something in Illinois called Startup Illinois a, a couple of weeks ago. We have some other regional uh, developments in the, in the months to, to come. So how do you build up these entrepreneurial ecosystems? I said at the beginning, how do you lift up the second tier and make them more like a Silicon Valley? You know, Silicon Valley is unique and you're, it's hard to replicate, but learning from that model and figuring out and ranking essentially different regions, what, what's working well, what's not working so well, how can you improve it to lift it up to the next level? is very important. One of the most important aspects you see, though, which is why things like uh, Startup Mixology are important, is this idea of mentorship and building a community around entrepreneurs. Sure, access to capital is important, and that's indeed a, a, a key focus. Sure, access to talent is important, indeed, being able to attract people and, and get companies, you know, people who are willing to join, uh, move to a city and join a company, believe if for some reason that doesn't work, there are other companies in that space they can join uh, is also important. But ultimately, it's about that community, which means entrepreneurs helping each other and you know, a generation of successful entrepreneurs helping the next generation, both with capital and with, with mentoring. That really is what kind of breaks these regions out, out of the second tier into the first tier, so that will be a, a big focus. So this is important. My, my experience, as I said, for the last now 25 plus years, uh, first with AOL, then more recently with uh, uh, companies like uh, Living Social and, and, uh, and Zipcar. And I'll talk more about Living Social because it's a phenomenon, success story, and the growth they've had just in the past year, adding over 1,000 employees is really quite extraordinary. All of this and, you know, has really taught me the importance of entrepreneurship, why it is so important to our nation, why it's fun and gratifying, not just as a way to make money, which is, which is great, but also as a way to really uh, change the world. So I applaud the fact that you've chosen this path. It's a, it is a risky path, and just as I said, you know, in some of our darker days with AOL, there were people who loved me a lot who were saying, maybe you should try to do something else. Uh, it, it's important work and sticking with it and really having the team around you people aspect that you really can can work together with, really being passionate about the idea you're pursuing, not just doing it as a, as a temporary thing just because it seemed like something to do, but because you're really passionate about it. You, you lose sleep over trying to figure out how to break through with that idea. And very importantly, as I said, the perseverance, those three Ps really are are critical. So I applaud the fact that you're here. It obviously means you're already either doing something or contemplating doing something. And it's important not just in terms of the business you're building, but collectively, it's important to our nation. Uh, Steve, thank you for being here with us. Uh, I appreciate that. Great my name is Sean Johnson. And my question for you is, aside for some of the things in the ecosystem that are useful to an entrepreneur, access to capital ideas and mentorship. Uh, in your opinion, could you highlight some of the uniquenesses about DC that makes it ideal for an entrepreneur? Sure, DC is an interesting city. And as I said, it's it sort of developed in a, in a interesting way over the past last 20 years or so. I do think it helps, even though it, maybe 25 years ago, I thought it was maybe, maybe more of a negative, that it's, it's sort of got this foundation around the government. They provide a certain stability to it. Even, even in the last few years when the economy has been pretty rocky, DC actually done pretty well. I've had friends come from Florida and other areas who, where the, the economy is really quite suffering. They come to DC and it's almost like, it's like another world. And it seems like the restaurants are you know, busy and there's just a lot of vitality and action going. So it provides a, a stability, economic stability, almost a baseline in terms of jobs and the economy, which I think is, is helpful. It also has some interesting opportunities because there are a lot of companies that can do things that relate to the government, uh, that aren't just government contractor things, but innovative entrepreneurial technology-driven disruption companies. There are a lot are happening now. And healthcare, for example, is one of the area where the government's opened up access to healthcare data, and there's a bunch of companies that are that are focusing on that opportunity and, and being in DC in that case is, is an advantage as opposed to being in, in, in other places. So there's, so there's, there's some, some unique dynamics, plus it's just a, 
I, you know, obviously you agree because you're here, a, a reasonably livable city where there's a lot of interesting things going on, but it doesn't necessarily have quite as much, I'm not sure what the word to use, I don't want to offend anybody in bigger cities like New York or Los Angeles, but it's a nice balance between being a kind of a quiet, smaller city and a, and a you know, bigger, bustling city. It's sort of, sort of in, the, in the middle. But ultimately, it's about the people and the talent and the ability of DC to be a magnet for talent, often coming for other reasons, not necessarily coming here to say, I'm going to you know, go start a company or I'm going to get involved in some entrepreneurial company. But once they're here, they may be kind of pulled into something. And the, and the level of talent, the quality of the universities, a lot of other things are, are really uh, uh, helpful. I must say, when I first moved here, I had no desire to live in Washington, D.C. I had no plan to live in Washington, D.C. If I was, when I was you know, growing up in Hawaii or went to college in, in Massachusetts, if I made a list of 10 places and you know, I wanted to live, wouldn't have been on the top 10 list. So I really came here by accident because there, I was intrigued with this idea of the internet and there was an early stage company that happened to be in, in this area and I moved here to join that, uh, that company. And once, even though, as I said, that company uh, wasn't successful, I was here and two of the people at that company and I went off and started AOL. And once we started, we went with dozens of people then hundreds of people then thousands of people then got married and kids and kids are in school and Suddenly, you know, 28 years later, you know, DC is sort of my home now, uh, and I see all the benefits of it, even though it wasn't initially at that time kind of part of the part of the master plan. And sometimes you find that's true in life. You kind of have to, you know, be flexible and open-minded, and and when you know, sometimes when doors open, you know, you should walk through them. My question is to do with uh, Startup America. The the is it a mentorship organization? Is it a VC fund? I mean, I kind of understand the charter, but what specifically? are you providing? It, it is not a venture fund. So it really is more about mobilizing and cheerleading and assembling resources and then making it easier for entrepreneurs to tap into those resources. And the first version of a website, startupamericapartnership.org, is up and it'll be relaunched in the, in the early fall with some other, other resources. But how do you get companies to make commitments? Uh, American Express and, and Cisco and Facebook and a lot of people have made pretty significant commitments to help entrepreneurs kind of get going, whether they're in the startup phase or the ramp up phase or the or the speed up phase. As, and a second part of that is how you build up these entrepreneurial ecosystems. We don't think it's sort of a national top down one size fits all effort. It's more of a bottoms up, particularly finding this the, these, these second tier regions and figuring out how to lift them up to be you know, first uh, tier regions. So that's the key part. There's a, I should say there's an adjunct to that that's separate from the Star of America partnership, which really is a private sector independent effort, uh, is I also am spending some time on the government policy side of things. I'm on something called the Jobs uh, Council on Jobs and Competitiveness, chaired by Jeff Immel. We had a meeting with the president earlier this week in, in uh, North Carolina, and also on a uh, co-chair of something called the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. That's the side of things that really is trying to work with the White House and Congress to figure out what is a roadmap for entrepreneurship that what does reduce barriers and does lock, unlock potential. That's more what the government can do or needs to do. Star of America Partnership is really more what the private sector can do while we wait for the government to do those things to make it a little easier for entrepreneurs to get going and a little easier for them to scale their companies. What are some of the things that small businesses should be paying attention to in terms of um, special initiatives or policy that can benefit us? And I'm talking about small business of 500 or less or 100 or less or less employees? Well, one thing to look at, uh, th th some, um, some folks are not familiar with some of the programs that already exist, like the Small Business Administration. You can go to their site, sba.gov, and they actually have a number of initiatives, including mentorship, including you know, loan guarantee programs, that for most entrepreneurs, they're unaware of or just don't know how to tap into. And so one of the things we actually talked with uh, this week with the president about is figuring out ways to streamline access to those and make people more aware of what's there. That's not to say there aren't additional things that need to be done, but there are some things that are currently exists that most people either unaware of or aware of, but just get frustrated trying to figure out how to navigate the system. But it, it, it is, they've demonstrated the ability to help a lot of companies succeed. I talked last week with uh, Kevin Plank, who's a founder of Under Armour, a great company in this region now in the Baltimore area, in the you know, athletic uh, apparel uh, area, multi-billion dollar you know, company now. Uh, and he said he couldn't have gotten going without a SBA loan. They, his first loan was $250,000 from some DC bank, but 88% of it was guaranteed by the SBA, and that really gave him the capital necessary to create what's now a, 
a huge successful global uh, a company. So trying to understand what programs already exist is a, is a good start. And then trying to you know, say, give us suggestions on things that can be done to kind of take it to the next level. And it kind of depends on where you are and at this stage of the company, where you are you know, physically, what sector you're in, because there are different programs. And one of the things we're trying to do with the next wave of uh, Startup America Partnership .org site is try to you know, identify some of those factors and create tools to make it easier for people to find the, the resources that will be helpful and relevant to them given their specific circumstance. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the heuristics you would use now in light of the experience at AOL about the longevity of technologies, um, especially for startup companies that may be putting everything into one basket to begin with, and how you plan for the natural lifespan of a technology? Well, that's a complicated question. I, I, I would not say there's, uh, there's maybe a lifespan, lifespan of specific technologies, but there's not necessarily a, a, a locked-in lifespan to a particular brand or a particular product or a particular service. And so part of the challenge, we did this you know, many times in the you know, 20 years I was involved with AOL, was having your eye on the prize. We wanted to get everybody online. There was a reason we called America Online, the reason we you know, gave discs away free. I'm sure you got some of them. Uh, the reason why we <laughs> you know, provided you know, free months and so forth. We really wanted to get America Online. We thought it was a powerful medium that would have all kinds of societal benefits and personal benefits, and we were just motivated to get everybody online, and that was our focus. How we executed against that idea uh, changed almost every year in terms of the partnerships we had, the particular technologies we deployed, uh, even how we priced the, the product, what services we provide. So you're constantly morphing them, morphing what you're doing to be relevant and, and kind of peek around corners and figure out what the, the next move is. And that path is, you know, continues uh, even to this day. The challenge, of course, is as the companies get larger and more bureaucratic, it's just harder to be nimble and move more quickly. And it's much easier to move quickly if you have dozens of employees. Uh, when we went public in 1992, we were the first internet company to go public, uh, we've been at it for seven years. We had, I think it was 185 employees. Eight years later, we had 5,000 employees. Merged with Time Warner had 80,000 employees. It's easier to move quickly when you have 185 or 85 or eight than it is when you have you know, tens of thousands. So that's, it, it's less about technology life cycles and more about building a culture of innovation that can scale as companies uh, get larger. And that's a challenge for many companies. Microsoft is, is, is facing a, you know, a tremendous success in the, in the, particularly in the 1990s. The last decade has been more challenging, even though they're doing a lot of really smart people, doing a lot of innovative things. Their ability to, to, to be as innovative and relevant has proven more, uh, more challenging. As a result, new companies, Facebook or, or Twitter, or even the revitalization of Apple have, have, uh, have kind of filled you know, that, that vacuum. But Apple is, I think, a great example of the point I'm making, that they've had their ups and downs. And they, they, there were many people in the late 90s who pretty much gave them up for dead. They said this company has 2% uh, market share, uh, it's declining. And I remember when Steve Jobs went back in and gave me a call and wanted to do some, do some different things. It was sort of like, it's, it's, you know, it's nice that you're kind of trying to rescue this company, but it is 2%. You know, that's, not, that's, not, you know, that's not a big number. And what he you know, really cleverly did was A, say, I believe in the brand and did some great things on the marketing side. B, I recognize the importance of teams, and there were some great people there, and he added some additional great people, including people that from a company had next, uh, and really had a, a team that really believed in Apple and believed in Steve and believed in, in, in the vision, uh, and then focused, went all on product and said, what, are pro what products are we going to do that are going to be more innovative on the, on the PC side and particularly are going to open up new categories, iPod being a, obviously a great example, and more recently the iPhone, uh, and basically took that brand, which stood for innovative, simple consumer experiences, and marched into other sectors and went from being irrelevant, I think the market cap when he went in was a billion dollars, to now, now being the most valuable technology company on earth, surpassing you know, Microsoft and you know, IBM and others, you know, I don't know what the current number is, but you know, $200 billion plus. That was basically believing in the power of the brand and the power of people and reinventing the company around innovative uh, uh, products. So you, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's never too late if you really have that, the, the core ingredients in terms of uh, particularly the, the people and you really have that, that, that uh, passion and you recognize, as I said, it's gonna take some time, perseverance is, is important. 
What's your uh, take on the competitiveness of American small business and the international concept as a future American economic competitiveness in, in, the, in the international arena? It, it's a matter of concern. I think, I think the, that's part of the reason I'm spending time on it. The, the, I think this, this, as I said, this nation has, was built on entrepreneurs building whole new industries that were largely based in the United States. We've seen over the last 10 or 20 years particularly what some people, Thomas Friedman, Fareed Zakaria, and others have called the rise of the rest, where other countries, particularly China and India, but others as well, have, have risen you know, up their game in terms of innovation and competitiveness and are putting pressure on the United States in, in that global context. That's going to continue. And, and to, to be naive about that would be you know, crazy. So it, it's easier for companies now to be formed in other you know, countries. Capital is flowing to those. Talent is flowing to those. So the question is, how do we make sure that we up our game to stay competitive in what is a more competitive global world? Some of that relates to celebrating entrepreneurship. When you go around the world, people say one of the great things about America is and it varies by region, by the way, it's not, it's not true all across America, is the uh, willingness to celebrate the risk-taking nature of entrepreneurship. There are many cultures that frown on that you know, in this country, you know, most parts of this country, uh, it's celebrated. Figuring out what you can do in terms of capital uh, and what's the, what, what policies you put in place to incent early stage investment in terms of you know, tax incentives and other kinds of things, and what things you can do to make sure that companies can scale and not just have to sell off is, 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 is very important. And the talent aspects are important. One of the things I'm particularly passionate about is immigration policy related to high-skilled workers. I think it's insane as, you know, as a country. Uh, we bring some of the best and brightest to our great universities here uh, to get you know, PhDs, and then all too often send them away. Uh, and they have to go back home, uh, and they end up creating companies there. It is insane. And so creating a, a, a more 21st century immigration policy that recognizes that building companies is more about assembling talent, and you want to be a magnet for talent. And not only shouldn't we send them away, one proposal is if you graduate with a, with a PhD, we should staple a green card to your your diploma, and including a letter from the President of the United States saying, please stay here and build your company here. We don't want to lose these people. We want them to stay here and build companies here or join companies that, uh, that can scale. So there's a mix of factors. I think they're all addressable, uh, but it's very important that as a nation we take the challenge seriously, both the challenge globally and the opportunity in terms of getting our economy moving, getting, getting our, uh, uh, job creation uh, moving you know, very seriously because if we're you know, complacent about it, we're going to continue to you know, lose ground. But the, all the things that, that we've seen just in the last 10 years, whether it be in, in the uh, internet space or you know, biotech or, or many other uh, places, there's still a lot of great ideas, a lot of great people, a lot of great companies, and, a, and as a nation, a great entrepreneurial ecosystem here. But we have to step up our game because everybody else is, is, is racing to, to replicate it and obviously wants to move into the lead. What would you say what you've seen in entrepreneurs is sort of a, a common pitfall? Is it they didn't know enough about marketing, they didn't know enough about finance, they didn't know enough about technology? That, what would you, how could you characterize that? It's hard because I've seen a lot of different examples of a lot of, you know, a lot of different ways to fail. So there, there's not, there's a lot of different ways to succeed. There are also a lot of different ways to fail. And so it's a little bit hard to, to generalize. I would say that the, if I had to pick just one, I think is not getting caught up in the group think. Either when things are going great or when things are going not great. Uh, I think there's too many people just, it's just sort of a, almost like a momentum play. And sometimes you even see, particularly when certain sectors are hot, there's almost like a free agent mercenary culture. Oh, I'm gonna do it just because it's hot. I don't even quite understand what it is, unless I care about it, but it seems hot and I think I can make some money. Uh, that usually is not a formula uh, for success. So being relatively even keeled. Now I used to say when I was CEO of AOL, one of my jobs is to be a shock absorber. And when everybody thought that, you know, we're gonna take over the world, kind of slap them down, and everybody thought we were gonna, you know, kind of, you know, end up in the garbage dump, bring them up. There's, there, was, there was these highs and lows in terms of psychology, stock price, all kinds of things, and you just kind of have to have a sort of, I thought, a sort of a, a more moderate, moderated, even keeled uh, approach to that. Uh, and as you think about regional ecosystems, I think it's also important to have that built to last mentality. That, of course, when markets are, are hot, everybody wants to play. And you see a, a rush of, of angel seed investment, for example. And we saw that in the late 90s. 
it completely dried up in the, you know, a few years later, and a bunch of companies were funded by that, couldn't get their next round of funding, and, and collapsed. Uh, so you have to recognize that, that, that you, it's, not, it, it's easy to be successful when times are great, and there's momentum, and you're in the right place at the right time with the you know, right people. It's, it's much tougher, and there are going to be cycles when, when it, you know, things it turns the other way. So having a strategy in each region that can withstand the next correction, which is inevitable. You can't really predict you know, when it will happen, but it's, it's, it, it will happen, I think, is, is, is very important. So it really is about, you know, as I said at the very beginning, the, the, the passion and perseverance aspect to it. If you really believe in a particular idea, a particular company, a particular product, a particular technology, a particular region, a particular anything, and you're in it for the long run, and you, and you commit to yourself to kind of be in it through those ups and downs, I, I think you're on a, a good path. If you're basically kind of trying to read the tea leaves and, and you know, if, you know, you're happy to play hockey, if hockey's fun and successful, but if, if, if it goes down, you may be able to play baseball, and you know, that doesn't work, you'll go play basketball. Kind of like jumping around in terms of not really committed to anything, just kind of flittering around kind of thing. I, I don't think that's you know, generally a path to success, and it's, it's certainly not helpful in terms of building scalable, sustainable entrepreneurial ecosystems, either at a regional level or a, or a national level. So I think this built to last is important. I think, unfortunately, in the internet space, it's a good news, bad news. I shouldn't say it's unfortunate. The good news is the barriers to entry have come dramatically down. Starting a company 20 years ago would cost millions of dollars, maybe tens of millions, but at least millions of dollars. Starting a company now costs sometimes thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, occasionally hundreds of thousands of dollars, not that often millions of dollars. So it's much easier to get going, much less capital. You can outsource more things and, and so forth. That's great. There's a flip side of that, which is because the barriers are low, there's a, you know, a ton of companies that are basically created in any one space, and getting the battle for attention becomes really much more important than the battle for, for, for capital. It's a little bit like the music business now, that there are a lot of bands and a lot of garages playing a lot of clubs that all want to hit it big and play Madison Square Garden or the Verizon Center or what have you. The success rate is very low, but everybody believes that they're going to be U2 or or they just, they just, they just do. Uh, and, and just recognizing there's that dynamic and figuring out it's not so much, and there's actually a lot of really good music that's recorded, and a lot of those bands are really good and have the potential to be you know, great, great successes, but breaking through the clutter uh, becomes very important. So having that perspective uh, of really bigger ideas that are more built to last, harder to get going, you know, harder to sustain, harder to scale, but if you're able to break through, you really have much more of an iconic change the world company. You know, that's clearly, clearly my bias. Anyway, thank you for, for coming this morning and thank you for coming to Startup Mixology and particularly thank you for being an entrepreneur.